The Lord woke me up at 2.30 and changed my message entirely. <laughs> it's, it's his church and it's his service, right? Yeah, so he, he, he has the ultimate prerogative, right? <laughs> but we're going to spring off of our study. Where have we been studying? John 17. So turn with me there, John chapter 17. <clears throat> and we're going to go through a lot of scriptures this morning. But you are very familiar with those Bible drills that we do here. And if you're new here to the chapel and visiting, I'm a Bible expositor, so I'm not so much a preacher as I am a teacher. And so I want you to know and to learn the Word of God. And so we spend a lot of time in the Scripture itself, right? And that's so important that you know the Scriptures. And we teach it expositionally, and all that means is that we start with a book of the Bible, the first word, the first verse, and then we'll go through the entire text bringing out the technical interpretation of the text. How many technical interpretations are there of every biblical text? One. Thank you. One. Make no mistake of that. One. But then once you find that technical interpretation of the text, then you make the application to your life uh, in any way you, you, the Lord seems to see fit for you. But first we want to draw the technical interpretation. But last time we were together, we ended off in verse 12 of chapter 17. We spent some time last week talking about how well kept we are from our father, by our Father, aren't we? Hmm? And we went through all the names of God, some, not all of them, I didn't go through the entire list, but we went through many of the names of God in the Old Testament that speak of His character, His keeping character, His loving character, His faithfulness in our life. So we want to finish this segment of chapter 17 where Jesus is praying for His disciples, and we'll pick it up in verse 13. Jesus says, but now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but they sh that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they may also be sanctified by the truth. Let's pray again for a moment. Lord, you said, whom you set free shall be free indeed, Lord. And many of us here have experienced the freedom, the liberation that you bring, Jesus. And you said that your truth is the very thing you use to set us free. And then you said your word is truth. Lord, we live in a world right now who have no regard for your word. No regard for what is true, for the truth. But, Lord, we do. And we recognize more and more, Lord. We are foreigners in a foreign land. This is not our home. We no longer belong here, Lord. We belong to you. And one day we'll be going where you are, to your kingdom. But in the meantime, Lord, help us, help us as your representatives, citizens of heaven, to represent you rightly, best we can, Lord, in your power and in your strength, for our good, for your glory, for the sake of those who would receive the love of the truth. We ask all this, holy Jesus, in your precious, precious name. And everyone said, amen. amen. <laughs> We are, uh, gentlemen, if you don't join us on Saturday morning, I strongly want to encourage you to come out. Uh, we're just beginning the pastoral epistles. We're in First and Second Timothy. We'll also be in Titus, but we're teaching them in chronological order. First Timothy, then Titus, then Second Timothy, which is basically to sum up the three books. To sum up the three books, gentlemen, the first one, <laughs> know your calling. Second we. Thank you. Know your calling, enter your calling, abide in your calling, stay in your calling, right? All right. And, and yesterday morning, I was sharing with you how young Timothy, as timid as he may be, Paul was encouraging him, as I go to Macedonia, please remain in Ephesus. Remain there. Stay in your calling. 
Why did he have to be encouraged? What was taking place in Ephesus? There was such hostility towards what was precious to him and all the other believers. When a society is in upheaval, politically and socially, that's where Timothy was in Ephesus. It was a society that was in upheaval, politically, socially. The politics couldn't be worse, could it? Being under the yoke of Rome. The social upheaval, the, the immorality was so rampant there in Ephesus. Ephesus had the temple of who? Diana. Diana. And the worship of the temple of Diana brought down every evening thousands of prostitutes into the city of Ephesus to offer themselves in supposed worship to Diana. But it was nothing more than a bla blazing display of their immorality. And so Timothy had to fight against that. And whenever, whenever immorality is rampant, what is forsaken? Truth. Doctrine. Moral failure or moral depravity always leads to theological and doctrinal error. Make no mistake about that. That's what happened in Timothy's day. Do you know that the church of Ephesus was one of the largest churches in the early church, in the first century church? Do you know how many, how many congregants were in the church of Ephesus at that time? Anybody have any idea? Somewhere between 30 and 50,000 people. Timothy and those who were following him in like manner in ministry were having a tremendous effect on the city of Ephesus, but not all the city. It was a huge city. Timothy died there. Uh, maybe I'll mention how he died a little later on in this service. But I'm drawing a parallel between what Timothy was going through there in Ephesus and the society as it was then and now what we have today. The reason why there's a wholesale forsaking of truth, of doctrinal, theological truth, is because of the moral depravity that is so prevalent in our society shouldn't be. And I think God wanted me to give you some tools to use to engage the culture. As you're out in the public square to make a defense why the Supreme Court decision was to be celebrated. I am shocked and appalled at the number of pastors and Christians who seem to be disgusted with the ruling. Well, Let's go for a little walk. Turn with me to Judges. Judges chapter 13. I'm going to read fairly quickly for a New Yorker. Probably light speed for you, all right? But you know we record the services, and so later on I strongly encourage you to maybe go back and listen, but jot down some of the texts that I'm going to be referencing. The first case I'm going to make is for the fact that only God, only God can create life in the womb. And life begins at conception. Make no mistake about that. And, and when a society or a people fall into moral depravity, they have no regard for the sanctity of life at any stage, even at its earliest stages or at the later stage of life. This society will happily kill grandma and grandpa because they'll be a burden, just as much as they think children are a burden today. So the first part of this, I'm going to present to you the fact that only God, only God can put fruit in the womb. Every child is a gift, a precious gift from God, right? Okay. Chapter 13. Are you there in Judges? Again the, children of Israel did e again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. Now there was a certain man from Zorah of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren, had no children. And the, and the, make point, and the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Indeed, now you are barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Now, therefore, please be careful not to drink wine 
wine or similar drink, and not to eat anything unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb. And he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. And so the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came to me, and his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God. Very awesome. But I did not ask him where he was from, and he did not tell me his name. And he said to me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. Now drink no wine or similar drink, nor eat anything unclean, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the to the day of his death. And Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, Oh, my Lord, please let the man of God whom you sent come to us again and teach us what shall do for the child who shall be born. And God listened to the voice of Manoah. The angel of the Lord came to the woman again as she was sitting in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not there. And the woman ran in haste and told her husband and said to him, Look, the man who came to me, look, look, he, the other day he has now appeared to me. Verse 11, So Manoah rose and followed his wife. And then they came to the man and said to the man, are you the man who spoke to this woman? And he said, I am. Wow, I am. It's a hint of who this is. Hmm? <laughs> Manoah said, now let your words come to pass. What will be the boy's rule of life and his work? And so the angel, the, the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, of all that I said to the woman, let her be careful. She may not eat anything that comes from the vine, nor may she eat or drink wine or similar drink, nor eat anything unclean. All that I commanded, let her observe. Then Manoah said to the angel, the angel of the Lord, please let us detain you and we will prepare a young goat for you. And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, though you detain me, I will not eat your food. Interesting. But if you offer a burnt offering, you must offer it to the Lord. For Manoah did not know he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, what is your name? That when your words come to pass, we may honor you. And the angel of the Lord said to him, why do you ask me my name, seeing it is wonderful? And so Manoah took the young goat with a grain offering and offered it upon the rock to the Lord. And he did a wondrous thing while Manoah and his wife looked on. It happened as a flame went up towards heaven from the altar that the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame from the altar. And Manoah and his wife saw this. They fell upon their faces to the ground. Then the angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and his wife. And Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to his wife, we shall surely die because we have seen who was this angel? Jesus. It's a theophany. It's Jesus, of course. Yeah. And so most uh, every theologian will agree. This is a theophany. This is a pre-incarnate vision of Jesus Christ given to Manoah. And what did Jesus tell them? You're going to have a baby. Now, well, that's always good news. We, we think so, don't we? Yeah. We always think it's good news. Unfortunately, you know, even in... Manoah's day. Israel didn't think it was such good news at a time. Turn with me, if you will. Let's go to Job. Job is just before Psalms. Job 31. Thirty-one fifteen is where we're going to be. Job 31. Job is speaking to God, and he's uh, presenting his case before God that he hasn't, he hasn't violated his servants in any way, that his servants, he's treated them as equals. You know, he hasn't been uh, reigning over them and trying to act superior to them. But nonetheless, in verse 15, he indicates that it was God who created them. It's God who put fruit in the womb. Verse 15 of chapter 31 of Job. Did not he, God, he made, who made me in the womb, make them my servants? Did not the same one fashion us in the womb? Listen, no, no, nobody comes into existence just by chance, right? It's not time plus matter plus... That's what the evolutionists believe. It's time plus matter plus chance. Impossible, right? We, we know that's an impossibility. Follow the science. Real science, right? Real science lets us know that no, 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 no. There's, there's an intention here, and the intention is of God when every womb 
has fruit in it, it's only by the hand of God. And that's what Job is confirming. If I were to go to the shepherd psalms of the Bible, which ones would they be? That's right, 22, 23, and 24, the shepherd psalms. Who's the shepherd? Jesus, Jesus himself. Go to 22 for a moment. Go to Psalm 22, the shepherd psalm 22. It speaks of Jesus Christ. It's a psalm of David, but David is prophesying. <clears throat> and, and we're just going to look at a couple verses here. Again, making the point that it is God who puts fruit in the womb. It is God who brings forth life. And life begins when? At conception. At conception. At conception. Verse 9 of chapter 22, or Psalm 22, but you are he who took me out of the womb. You made me trust while I was on my mother's breasts. I was cast upon you from birth, from my mother's womb. You have been my God. Go with me to Psalm 127. 127. Psalm 127, verse 1, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain. Who build it? Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early and to sit up late, eat the bread of sorrows. For so he gives his beloved sleep. Well, not me last night. He woke me up. <laughs> Verse 3 in particular, now behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward, isn't it? Yeah. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them, for they shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. Well, one of the major uh, purposes and objectives of marriage is procreation. You see, God has made us sexual beings, and our, our sexuality or our, our gift of sex and the power of sex is the power to create, the power to recreate ourselves in another human being. And for the purpose of glorifying God and serving God. How we have abused that gift that God has given us, haven't we? Look at Psalm 139 for a moment. Go there. Again, a psalm of David. Speaking of the Holy Spirit, and how could we ever go anywhere from the Holy Spirit? There are those who erroneously, erroneously believe that once the church is raptured, the Spirit will no longer be on earth. Is that true? No, 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 no. The, the uh, great mystery in Thessalonians of him who is restraining, who will be taken away, is not the Holy Spirit. The answer is, who's going to be taken away? The church, the church, the Holy Spirit is everywhere, and he makes that clear here. You know, you could go down into Sheol, and he's there. Go up into heaven, and he's there. There's no place you can escape from where God is, right? But nonetheless, when he talks about life, look at verse 13 of chapter 139, Psalm 139. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. And my soul knows very well, for my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, but in your book they were all written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. God knows our birthday, he knows our death day, he knows it all, doesn't he? Yeah, how wondrous and wonderful are his works, aren't they? What is your name that we may honor you? And all of this comes about, Manoah said. And what did he say? It is wonderful. Does it remind you of any other text? Yes. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God. Right? And the, it's the same word there, same root word, Pile. So we know that it was, speaking, it was God speaking to Manoah. It's God speaking to us now in Psalm 139. Turn to me to Isaiah chapter 44. Isaiah 44. Oh, what a beautiful sound. 
you turning the pages of your Bible? You know? What are we going to do if all this technology shuts down one day? Well, we have the Word of God, right? Light a candle and read the Word. <laughs> Einstein said, uh, he was asked the question, uh, how did he think the next world war would be fought? He said, I don't know about the next one, but the one after that is going to be fought with sticks and stones. <laughs> Throw us into the dark ages. <laughs> Isaiah 24. Oh, verse 24. Yeah, Ver chapter 44, yeah, verse 24. I'm so happy you correct me. you got to forgive this senile old man. Isaiah 44, verse 24, Thus says the Lord your Redeemer, and he who formed you from the womb, I am the Lord who makes all things. I stretch out the heavens all alone, who spreads abroad the earth by myself. Who is he? He's the creator God who has created everything, including every child that is given life in the womb. A little more evidence. Go to Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1. And take note of these things because listen to me, beloved. There are a lot of people who you know who call themselves Christian who have no understanding of God's word. They don't have a working knowledge of the scriptures. They couldn't make a defense for the sanctity of life, that life is given by God from conception. And you need to share these things with them. You're going to have this conversation when you go out there. And don't be hesitant. Have the conversation. In, in, listen to me now. In times when a society is in political and social upheaval, it is an ideal time to be martyred, persecuted, to die for Christ. So what happened to Timothy? It's a very hard, it is a very difficult time to live for Christ. Do you understand? Since our conception as a nation, it has been easy to be a Christian in the United States, unlike the whole rest of the world. When has it ever been safe to be a Christian? Only here in this short period of time since the inception of the United States. Now, now today, for the first time in our history, every institution, every power within our society stands against what we hold dear. They're hostile. If they could eradicate you, some of them, if they could eradicate you today, they would. So yes, 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 this is, a, this is an ideal time for you to be persecuted. Some martyred. But it is the most difficult, listen to me, it is the most difficult time you have ever experienced in your life to truly let his light shine out there. But you must do it. You need to do it. Why? For their sake. My people perish. Why? Lack of knowledge. Where did I say go? Okay, I'll go there. I'll go there. Chapter 1. The words, verse 1, the words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests who were at Antioch in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, the king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign, it came also in the days of Jehoiakim, uh, and the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the end of the eleventh reign of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, da 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 da, da, da. verse 4, and then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, who's God speaking to? Yes, God is speaking directly to the prophet concerning the prophet. Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. What? What? Yeah. Isn't it wonderful that God purposed, God the artisan purposed to fashion you exactly the way you are? Yeah, when he fashioned me, he had a fire hydrant in mind. That's what he looked at when he made me, you know. Yes, before you were formed, I knew you in the womb. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you to be a prophet to the nations. Is there, is there any doubt in your mind? Hmm. I don't want to go too far down this road. 
But Wednesday night I mentioned that there's going to be a great deception falling upon the world. What's this great deception that's coming? Aliens. Aliens. Now listen, make no mistake. Did you see the headlines about the Russian scientists confirming aliens? Now listen to me. This is going to be the greatest deception Satan has ever played on the human race. When he said to Eve, hath God really said? Far worse is going to be this deception to deceive even the elect, if it were possible, where the whole world will embrace science and the speculations of science rather than the revelation of God, which is true. And they'll be going to believe the deception that's coming about that we were created by aliens. Aliens fertilized the planet. Aliens gave us all of the wisdom for the civilizations throughout human history. Aliens. And do you know how many people in the world today are ready to believe that? There are, listen to me. There are more people in the world that believe in aliens than believe in God. Hmm. But without question, in God's revelation, in God's word, and God's word has been proven to be true over and over, time and time again, yet the moral depravity of man will reject truth every time. The lust of man, the desires of man will always trump reason and thinking. You doubt that? Go to a buffet. <laughs> Eat till you're full. And then have somebody walk you over to the dessert table. You know, it's unreasonable for you to put another thing in your mouth. But you do. <laughs> But you know what I'm saying, right? The greatest birth ever told, foretold by God himself. Luke chapter 1, turn there. You know, some people come to our services and they visit our church and they're they're told that children 12 and under can't come into the service. And then they accuse me of hating children. I've had people tell me that. You don't like children, do you? (laughs) If you you know me, then you know just the opposite is true. I take all your babies home. You know, when they can talk back, you can have them back. But here in uh, Luke's gospel, in, in the beginning there, chapter 1, we, we have the angel foretelling of the birth of John the Baptist. Verse 13, and the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zacharias, your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. Isn't that wonderful? Now, you, you, know, you, you know I love looking at the meaning of names and, and places, etc., etc. And so this is wonderful. Right here in just one verse is the gospel. Zechariah means? See, not like some of you. God remembers. Zechariah means God remembers. Elizabeth means? His oath or his covenant. John means? Gracious. God remembers his covenant. Be gracious as a forerunner. He's going to bring salvation to the world. Wow. Could it be any more obvious? Isn't that wonderful? Don't you get excited about that stuff? Yeah. Did you have your coffee? <laughs> Goodness. Yes, and you should call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness. Isn't, isn't it true, Glory? Huh? Uh, no more joy and gladness come into your heart than when you hold that little boy. Isn't that true? Yeah, and then he pukes on you. <laughs> no, but it's true. Children are such a blessing. And many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He shall drink neither wine nor strong drink like Samson, and he will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. What a contrast. Did you ever do a study in the contrast between Samson and John the Baptist? How both of the births were foretold of angels, both of the Nazarites from the womb to the tomb, but what different lives they lived. Samson lived for himself, didn't he? But John... The greatest of all men, John, never performed a miracle, not one. He didn't have supernatural strength. Oh, he did in another sense, didn't he? But John, John lived for Jesus and Jesus alone. He must, he must increase, I must decrease. Don't follow me any longer, follow him, he said. 
Chapter 1 again, verse 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. We never get tired of the Christmas story, do we? I, I never do. And having command, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, for the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. The Lord is there. What's the, what's the name for that? The Lord is there in the Old Testament? Shema. Shema. Jehovah Shema. The Lord is there. The Lord is there in every concern. The Lord is there in every situation. The Lord is there in all of our life in totality. From the beginning stages of our life to the very end of our life, the Lord is there. The Lord is there, he said. And having come in, the angel said to rejoice, highly favored. But when she saw him, verse 29, she was troubled at the saying, and consider what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son. And you shall call his name Yeshua. What's that name for God in the Old Testament? Jehovah Shua. I am salvation. Jesus, Yeshua. He will be great, and he will be called the son of the highest. The God of the highest is who? El Elyon, God most high. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Verse 41. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, that the babe leapt in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why has this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting was sounded in my ears, the babe leapt in my for joy. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. Are you in any doubt that God our Father is the creator of all things and creator of life? Are you in any doubt that it is God himself who places fruit in the womb? And blessed is the man whose quiver is full? If you're a young family, have as many children as the Lord will allow you to have. You can afford them all, believe me. You will. Some, you'll find a way. But the biggest mistake in my life, the biggest regret of my life is that I only had one. I purposed only had one because of my selfish desire for material things. Every single one of your precious children are worth more than any material possessions you ever acquire. No, more than that, Jesus said every single one of them are more precious to him than the entire weight of the, and wealth of the universe. Isn't that true? For what would a man give in exchange for his soul? Hmm? We don't seem to believe that today, and Israel didn't believe it in their day. Turn with me to 2 Kings. We uh, were rehearsing a little bit of Israel's history on Wednesday night. Uh, you know that after the death of Solomon, it was a divided kingdom. There was Israel to the north, and its capital was Samaria, and there was Judah to the south, and the capital was Jerusalem. And Israel, the older brother, was far worse than Judah, the southern, in the southern kingdom, the younger brother. But, but nonetheless, they were both in rebellion to God and God's word and God's commandments. They were seduced by the peoples of the land, the pagans around them. When uh, Balak wanted to curse the children of Israel, he hired Balaam, the prophet, to curse them. God would not allow the prophet to curse them. But what did Balaam tell him? Tell Balak to do? Send the most sexually provocative, the most loose women in your community down to entice them and to worship your gods, and then God will strike them. And that's precisely what happened, you know. 
Satan has always used the tool of sexual immorality and sexual temptation to weaken a nation, a people, a family, a marriage, a man. And unfortunately, unfortunately, even in our day, so many women fall prey to sexual temptations. But that's how Israel had fallen away from the Lord. This is what we're reading now in chapter 17 of 2 Kings. If we look at, uh, let's begin at... Uh, Verse 13, yet the Lord testified against Israel. I'm sorry, are you there? This is 2 Kings 17, 13. Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all of his prophets, every seer, saying, turn from your evil ways. And keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law which I commanded your fathers and which I had sent to you by my servants, the prophets. Nevertheless, they would not hear, but stiffened their necks like the necks of their fathers who did not believe in the Lord their God. Let me, let me make a point here. Everybody wants to go to heaven. Everybody wants eternal life. Isn't that true? And, and, you know, I always like to start at that place when I'm talking to people, witnessing to people. I say, you know, you'd like to go to heaven, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you be sure of heaven? Do you want to be sure of heaven? Well, what did Jesus say? Jesus said in John eleven twenty six. 26, what did he say, James? Are you out there, James? Where is he? In the back? Oh, he's guarding. He's guarding you today. What a wonderful man. In eleven twenty six, Jesus said that he would give everlasting life to everyone who lives in and believes in Jesus. It's not here alone. It has to be here, living in Jesus. If you were going to Israel of old, when they were going to the temple on Sabbath, you would think, oh, my God, these people are wonderful. They all believe in God. Doesn't everyone tell you that you encounter they believe in God? Well, so many in our in, were in the buckle of the Bible belt, and they'll tell you that. They believe in God, but yet when you, when you observe their life, when you look at the priorities of their life, those things that move them in their heart, he will give eternal life to everyone who lives in Jesus and believes in him. Hmm? So Israel, oh, they said they believed, but they weren't living in God. Nevertheless, they would not hear Verse 15, and they rejected my statutes and his covenant that he had made with their fathers and his testimony, which he had testified against them. They followed idols, became idolaters, and went after the nations who were all around them concerning whom the Lord had charged them that they should not do like them. How were they enticed? By their own lusts and their desires. Look, idol worship is simply putting anything, whatever that desire may be, before God. It may be your occupation, your occupational pursuits. It, it, it may be a, a love of golf. You know, some be, I remember one fellow I tried to witness to because we, we were very close friends until I got saved. And then we couldn't hang together anymore because I couldn't enjoy the things we enjoyed in previously. Oh, but he was very, very avid golfer, loved to golf. And he said, look, I got my G, you got your G. Let's not talk about this anymore. Golf was his God. Amazing. Hmm. That's not so highly unusual, is it? You know, speaking to someone who's in a Christian motorcycle club, when you look at their garb, it's more about the motorcycle than it's about the Christian, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. Where do you find your identity? Is your identity in Christ? or some other pursuit, some other idol that you have in life. And, and basically, we know that behind every single idol is the worship of who? Self. 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 And so God is accusing Israel. They did the very same thing that he said they shouldn't do. They did. They embraced the idolatry and the immorality and the materialism and the self-love of all of the nations surrounding them and turned from the one true God, from the only real love, the true love, that's in the world. So they left all the commandments. Verse 16 now, chapter 17. They left all the commandments. The Sheol with the Supreme Court. You, you heard the rhetoric, right? Yeah. Now, our judicial system and legislative system was to establish and enforce laws that 
will support and follow God's law. That's what made us such a great nation in our founding. We were founded upon Judeo, Old Testament, Christian, New Testament principles of life, of justice, of the freedom and independence of every individual for the right, the pursuit of liberty and God. <laughs> Not just happiness, but God, right? Now, what are, what are, now, now we, listen, we have political leaders on another party advocating violence against you and your belief. What did Jesus say in his high priestly prayer to the Father about those who are his in this world? The world will hate you. They'll hate you. Now that's what's happening. His words are coming true. Look at me at the rest of the text. Verse 16, so they left the commandments of the Lord their God. They made for themselves molded images, two calves made of wood, images, and worshipped all of the hosts of heaven and served the Baal. Many Baal worshippers today, right? I mentioned one, Golf of Baal, foot of Baal, a base of Baal. Huh? Verse 17, and they call, and listen, this is the one that really, you know, when I first became a Christian, I don't know what was going on in my coconut, but God led me to study, for, for, seriously, first book I ever studied in my life was Ezekiel. Boy, oh boy, oh boy, you know, I felt like Jim and Taxi with my hair straight up, you know, oh, what is this about Alex? <laughs> what in the world is this? You know? And when, I read, and when I read that passage, he caused their sons and daughters to pass through the fire. They must have been making s'mores, roasting marshmallows. That what? No, no. And then I found out what it meant. Oh, it was sickening. Very sickening because of, because of my own personal past. And very disturbing to me. And that's why I got very involved with a, a group at that time. It was called Operation Rescue. Some of you may know Operation Rescue. Yeah, pro-life movement, and we risk the rest. And we, you know, I mean, we go, we go into abortion clinic and surround the clinic, and we wouldn't have any identification, and the state police would come, and they'd knock you over the head. And everybody was John Doe. And what are you going to do with 300 people? They won't tell you their name. They have no personal identification on them, you know. And most of the time, they just you know, release us immediately. But I realized it was attacking a symptom rather than the real problem. And the real problem is the lostness of man, you know, the ignorance of man. Hmm? But nonetheless, this passage means that they were taking their children, their born children. And there is some reason to believe, I haven't had it validated yet. If you have it validated, please send it to me, that the state of California, the legislators in California want to enact a bill to allow the people of California to kill their children after 28 days after birth. 28 days after birth. How demonic, how barbaric, how insane. You see, it's no different than what they did. When the, when, what they would do, they would, there was a lot of sexual promiscuity. And, and because of the sexual promiscuity that had taken place when they embraced all of the paganism and the immorality of the peoples around them, there's a lot of unwanted children. It's a problem now, not a blessing that there's fruit in the womb. Now, they didn't have the technology that we have today where we can destroy them in the womb. This place that was meant to be the safest place for humankind for the first nine months of their existence, today, in our world, it's the most dangerous place. 50% in the womb, destroyed. But Israel had to give birth. And then once they gave birth, they would participate in these pagan festivals and orgies. And they take the god Molech, he was a bronze statue, a big, large bronze statue with his arms stretched out, and they would create these bonfires, put the statue in the middle, and they'd heat it up to where it's red hot. And in the meantime, they're getting into these euphoric highs through their pharmacia and their alcoholism, and they're running around and they're dancing in their nakedness, in their half-crazed state. And then, and then at the height of it all, they would take their babies and throw them into the arms of Molech, and they'd roll off into the fire and die. And their screams would overshadow the screams of their children, their dying babies. How sick. That's, that's what's being described here. The, God said children are a reward from the Lord, a blessing. The greatest, one of the greatest blessings in my life is me boy. He's preaching at his church this morning. We were up there last week, didn't we? 
And I said, son, one day I'm going to grow up and be the man like you. <laughs> I so admire that boy, you know. But I wanted to abort him. I wanted to kill him before I was saved. I didn't know any better. Thank God. Thank God his mother knew the Lord. She was in a rebellious period, and she met me, and, oh, girls, be careful, be careful, be careful. But, but God, but God. Mm -hmm. Verse 17, and they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire, practiced witchcraft and soothsaying, and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord, to provoke him to anger. Therefore, the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them from his sight. And there was none left but the tribe of Judah. Now, you know what happened in 721 B.C. The Assyrians came in and, and destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel. It would never be again. Destroyed the capital of Samaria. And, and those that they didn't slaughter, they carried away to be slaves and captives in Assyria. And the Assyrians were a people far worse, far worse than the Jews. You would not, listen, if you think ISIS is bad, you should read about what the Assyrians did to their captives. Ooh give you nightmares. Seriously. So, the only one left was Judah. Jeremiah 32. Go there. How many years Jeremiah chapter 32 Psalms Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Isaiah, Jeremiah, 32. 721 B.C., the northern kingdom of, Assyria, of Israel goes into captivity by the Assyrians. God is giving Judah time for repentance. We just got through, fellas, we just got through studying Jeremiah on Saturday morning. What a, what a wonderful study it is, but what a stark and sobering parallel between Israel of old, Judah of old, and the United States today. And Jeremiah prophesied for how long? 40 years. How many converts? 40 years. One. Hey, I'm so thankful you're here. <laughs> One. And God gave Judah every, every opportunity to repent, to turn. The book of Jeremiah could be summed up, return to me. Return to me. That's what God is crying out to Israel, Judah, and they won't. Look at chapter 32. Um, that's, he's prophesying the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. The Babylonians made three sieges. The, the last act of rebellion towards the, the control that Babylon was, was having over Judah was their last because then Nebuchadnezzar came in and destroyed it completely, destroyed the temple, burned the city to the ground. Verse 31 of chapter 32, for this city has been to me a provocation of my anger and my fury from the day that they built it, even to this day, so I will remove it from before my face. The very city, the very place where God was to be made known from. Now he says, all you do is provoke me to anger. You keep poking me in the eye. Because of all the evil of the children of Israel and the children of Judah, which they have done to provoke me to anger, they, their kings, their princes, their priests, their prophets, the men of Judah, the inhabitants of everybody, the whole city, the whole society is so polluted, so corrupted, so perverse. Sound like today? It surely does. Verse 33, and they have turned to me their back and not the face. Though I taught them, rising up early and teaching them, yet they have not listened to receive instruction. But they set their abominations in the house which is called by my name to defile it. And they built the high places of Baal, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire to Molech, which I did not command them, nor did it come into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. 
Now, therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning this city for which you say, it shall be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. God is prophesying the destruction of the city because they're causing their sons and daughters to pass through the fire. Ezekiel, that's where I first saw this phrase. Go with me to Ezekiel 16. Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel. Jeremiah chapter, uh, excuse me, Ezekiel chapter 16. I'm going to start at verse 15. When you get to, your, to there, uh, tell me if your Bible has a heading over verse 15. Israel rejects God. Anybody else? Jerusalem's harlotry. I take no pleasure in stating this, but I'm stating truth. Jesus very distinctly said he wanted his people, his church, to know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The supposed church in America is more like a whore than the body, than the, than the bride of Christ. The harlotry that Jerusalem committed pales in comparison to the spiritual harlotry, adultery that, that the church in the West is committing. And as I've said to you before, beloved, please, please have your eyes open. Listen with your eyes. Listen with your eyes. And that'll reveal everything. There is the body of Christ. She is the bride of Christ. She's beautiful. Just like your bride's going to be, right? Ray? In the end of next month? Beautiful. Radiant. But then there's Christian dumb, with the emphasis upon the because they don't really know God. They're Christian in name only. And that's why we have the trouble we have today. Hypocrites. So many unbelievers are absolutely right when they say, well, I don't want to go to church. The church is full of... Because it's true. It's true. As in... Judah's day, so too in our day. Please look with me. Verse 15, chapter 16 of Ezekiel. But you trusted in your own beauty, played the harlot because of your fame, and poured out your harlotry on everyone passing by who would have it. You took some of the garments and adorned multicolored high places for yourself and played the harlot on them. Such things should not happen nor be. You have also taken your beauty, jewelry, the gold and the silver, which I had given you and made for yourself male images and played the harlot with them. You took your embroidered garments and covered them. You set my oil and my incense before them. Also my food, which I gave you, and the pastry, the fine flour, the oil, the honey, which I fed you. You set it before them as sweet incense. And so it was says the Lord. Moreover, you took your sons and your daughters whom you bore to me. These you sacrificed to, this, to them to be devoured. Were your acts of harlotry a small matter? What you have, that you have slain my children and offered them up to be by causing them to pass through the fire in all of your abominations and act of harlotry. You did not remember the days of your youth. Wow. How did this happen? Self-love. The desire for pleasure. So often in our society, you know, I, I use this phrase quite often in the past, you know, the church wants to be cool instead of consecrated, hip instead of holy. We, we want to have our sin. We want to live like the world, but we want to have the hope of heaven. We want to have a lost life and a saved soul. And so many, listen, so many churches are offering that to people today, but it's a, it's, 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 it's a charade. It's a lie. You cannot live a lost life and believe you have a saved soul. The Bible never supports that. Now, I'm not giving you my opinion. I'm telling you what the Word of God is to say. This is not my opinion. It doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't even matter what the Supreme Court thinks. It doesn't matter what the left thinks. It doesn't matter what the right thinks. What does God say is true? And what God says is true is that he puts fruit in the womb, and you have no right to destroy what he has brought to life. No right, because then it's murder. How did we get here? 
all of this, what did I say? You abandon theological and doctrinal truth when what happens? Morality. Moral depravity. When did we go into a moral free fall in the United States? When? Right after World War II. Listen, you, you, can, you, can, you can trace it. You can f the, the, the collapse of, of, of dignity and discretion in dress happened with the swimsuit industry, you know. But in 19, around 19, I think it was either uh, 53 or 54, a couple years after I was born, Playboy magazine began to be published. Who, who, who? How, how, many, how many little boys? How many little boys would stumble across their father's pornography, their father's Playboy magazines, and become defiled? And, and after a while, you view pornography long enough, you know, you go from a defiled conscience to what? A seared conscience. You know, you, you, you sear, you cut off a limb, in the Civil War, you had to sear it, right? To cut those, to close those arteries, keep the bleeding, you become numb, your conscience becomes seared. After it becomes defiled, it becomes seared. And then if you allow your conscience to be seared long enough, what happens to it? It becomes evil. Ooh, just the word sounds terrible, doesn't it? Now listen, I'm not, it's not my opinion, this is the word of God. You can study it for yourself, get your concordance out, look up the word conscience, and you'll see where the Bible tells you you can have a defiled conscience, you can go on to having a seared conscience, and then you can take that final step in your digression, and you can have an evil conscience. That's what we have today. And so after World War II, it was eat, drink, and be merry. They won the physical war. They never even entered into the spiritual battle that was taking place here. And we went into a moral free fall. And when, listen to me now, Lust will always trump reason. Desire will trump truth. You understand? You incite that appetite. I don't care how bad that ice cream is for me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, right? And then shortly after, pornography was so readily available, what happens as a result of inciting that appetite? Sexual promiscuity, fornication, adultery is rampant. We end up having a sexual revolution. When was the sexual revolution? In the 60s. In the 60s. Turn to me to Romans chapter 1. You, we've been here before. Listen, I'm rehearsing all of this with you because I want you to be able to make a defense when you speak to people out there to try to bring them to a reasonable understanding of what is taking place so that God can change their hearts. We were all there, but God, right? Pick it up in chapter 1 of Romans at verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness, ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Isn't, isn't that precisely what our government is doing? The government of the United States is suppressing truth. Yes. The government of the United States is a criminal organization, a criminal enterprise right now. I, I, you know, I'm so, it breaks my heart to say this. It's not the government I grew up in. It's not the country I grew up in. But the demonic influence in this nation is like such as never before. And Paul the Apostle, I love the Apostle Paul. He's my hero. He warned me. He said, Pastor Ritt, in the last days, perilous times will come. What's that word? Kalepos. Kalepos times. What does it mean? Demonic, demonic force. That's precisely what we're seeing today. Demonic forces. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteous because what we may known of God is manifest to them for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world is invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things which are made even his eternal power, his Godhead. So they are without excuse. What did he say bears witness of the truth that God is? The world, everything, creation. The Bible never tries to defend the existence of God. It says, in the beginning, God, Elohim. He doesn't try to prove his existence. He is. 
<laughs> right? And, and God says that in the heart of every man, every man, they know, although they may even be in denial. Largest river in the world, denial, right? <laughs> they may be in denial, but they know that his existence is true. You cannot have the beauty, the majesty, the, 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 just the, the complexity of creation without having a creator. You know, I use the analogy like this, this watch of mine. You see this, this watch, the wristband is made of wood. I get more conversations about this watch. And then I'm able to tell you, you know, see this watch? There was an oak tree out in the woods and one day, termites took on the oak tree, and it formed this wrist, this wristband and this watch. And over time, and the right climatic conditions that took place in the atmosphere, everything formed and came together, and the crystals, and guess what? Look at that. Isn't that something? Cuckoo, cuckoo. That's how they look at you, right? You're cuckoo. Time plus matter plus stands. That's what they say about it. Do you know the complexity of just your eyeball? What's that little, little bacterium in your system that has that flagellum that spins at 100,000 revolutions per minute in your system? And listen to me, and it can reverse in a moment. We can't make a machine that can do that. Do you understand that? It's amazing, fearfully, wonderfully made. Yeah. And what could be known of God is, is there. It's in creation. God revealed himself in creation. Then God revealed his moral and ethical purity through the law. The commandments, the testimonies, the statutes of the Lord are true, rejoicing the heart, right? It's wonderful when, when an when a individual, when a family, when a marriage lives to the law, it brings such beauty, such order, such peace, such joy. Hmm. Because although they knew God, verse 21, they did not glorify him as God, nor were unthankful, but became futile in their thoughts. And their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorrupt, incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things, aliens. Therefore, God, verse 24, now 24 in particular now, speaking of the sexual revolution, God, therefore, God gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forevermore. Amen? Amen. So, that, 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 listen, as I have said, it happens in the past, it's happening now. What do we learn from history? We learn nothing from history. That's what we learn. We learn nothing from history. Just as in the past, in the moral free fall that Israel and Judah had experienced, they forsook truth. In the moral free fall that we have experienced since after World War II, we have forsaken truth. There's a wholesale forsaken of the truth of God's word, and they'll rather believe the lie. And I'm telling you, the lie's coming. Oh, the nations, the nations of the world are being deceived by the chief conspirator. Who's that? Satan. And they're letting out this information about aliens a little bit at a time. Do you know that NASA hired a bunch of religious leaders? Did you know that? Anybody know that? Yeah, what did they hire these religious leaders for? To prepare their people, their devotees, for the revelation that it's aliens. Isn't that quite amazing? Hmm. Even, even getting religious leaders to buy in on the great deception, to deceive even the elect if it were possible. This is the sexual revolution. The sexual revolution began in the 60s. I grew up during that time. It was a horrible time. I wish to God I had never grown up in that time. I wish to God I was never defiled the way I was defiled during that time. And it brought about the questioning of God. I, I believed in God when I was a little guy. I'd go down to, the, I was a Catholic, but I'd go down to the Catholic church. I'd get myself dressed up on Sundays. I'd go to church. My parents never, nobody else did. I just had an inclination towards God. And then other things awoke in my body. And because of the sexual revolution that was taking place, <laughs> wow, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, you know. Verse 26, of chapter 1 of Romans. The next step in the digression. 
For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, evil passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burning in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of the error that was due them. What kind of a revolution is this? This is a homosexual revolution. Have we had that? Let's go back to young Timothy in Ephesus. A society in political and social upheaval. A society that was burning in lust. He had a huge church. It would be a mega church by today's standards, but it was a true church. He taught the truth. And during one of the city's brazen festivals and immoral parades, Timothy stood out in front and tried to stop them, tried to reason with them, tried to make some sense with the residents of Ephesus of how much this is, this is flying in the face of God. And what did they do to Timothy? They bludgeoned him. They beat him. They mowed him over and rolled over, then over him with their parade, their pride parade. A few days later, he died. That's how Timothy died. No regard for the person of God, no regard for the things of God, no regard for truth. Now listen, you see what's happening, right? The society is becoming more, drop the screen, Darren. The society is becoming more and more violent every day, isn't it? And, and when we can wink, when we can turn the other way, when we can be so, so callous towards the, the violence done to unborn children, and now we want to kill children who are out of the womb up to 28 days? How barbaric are we? The violence that was committed against Austin, Derek, Aldright, Aldridge. You know who I'm talking about? Anybody know who I'm talking about? Nobody knows who I'm talking about? This young boy was murdered Tuesday. The last time he was in the news, he was taking his break to play basketball with some children in a lower income area. He's a Christian, very active in his church. He's on the safety team, was. He got married in 2019. He's having his first child in February. That child will be fatherless. Why? Because of the violence that was committed against him. So unnecessary. There was a domestic violence call, and he was simply going to the house to get the husband's side of the story, and he was ambushed. Had no opportunity, no chance. 25 years old, his life was taken from him. Was that not a tragedy? Is that not horrible? This Christian being cut down, this father, this husband, this son, this brother, senselessly murdered? I want to ask you a question. Is there any difference between Austin and all of these unborn nameless children? Is there? Not in God's eyes. Not in God's eyes at all. Uh, listen, I'm presenting truth to you. Jesus said the truth will set you free. Father, I want them to know your truth. This is the truth. Now, now in this digression that's taking place, we're, we've hit the final step. We're, we're down about as far as we can go right now. Sexual revolution, homosexual revolution. Put your eyes on verse 28. And please don't let me forget, we want to pray. This young man's memorial will be this afternoon, and, and we just want to pray for his family, for his widow, for everyone involved. It's just a horrible thing. I can't even imagine. You know, you, David, I know you and Frankie. Could you imagine if that was your Eric? Their son is a law enforcement officer. All these law enforcement officers have big targets on their back now. We're going to try to get involved. Uh, I'll give you more information in the future. It's something called Bronze Shield, where we help support those law enforcement officers here in Malden and Simpsonville. There's, there's lots of things we can do to help them. They're, they're underfunded, and they need more support. Another time. But now, verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over 
to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetous malice, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whispers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death. No heaven! There's no heaven for those people. Why? They don't live in Jesus. Not only do the same, but those who also approve of those who practice them. Ignorance of the truth. So what should our response be? Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 24. We'll end here. I'm sure this is familiar to most of you. I know it is. In a society, in a culture, in a day and time, where there's such political, and social, moral upheaval, what's the hardest thing in the world to do? Be a Christian. Live like a Christian. Represent Jesus Christ. Be a witness for Christian. Not here. It's easy here, isn't it? And that's what they're telling us. You, you keep your faith and you keep your Jesus in the four walls of your church. No. No. We have to go out there. Timothy had, had to engage that crowd in that parade. He had to. And what did he receive? A crown of what? Martyrdom. Martyrdom. Now, I, I'm not necessarily asking for that crown. <laughs> but I don't want to be a coward either. No. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 10. Now, I'll go before that. Uh, Through wisdom, a house is built, verse 3, and by understanding is established. By knowledge, the rooms are filled. Well, precious and pleasant riches. A wise man is strong. Yes, a man of knowledge increases strength. For by wise counsel, you will wage your own war. And in a multitude of counselors, there is safety. Wisdom is too lofty for a fool. He does not open his mouth in the gate. He who plots to do evil will be called a schemer. And devising of foolishness is sin. And a scoffer is an abomination to men. If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Listen to me. This is the day of adversity. You know, uh, we're a little chapel. We have a very little effect on our community, but you know, we can have an effect on individuals who come in among us. And we've seen that happen, and it's been happening. But I've told John Michael and the safety team to be on their guard. Who knows what can happen today, right? And, and I told the men on Saturday morning, I'm telling you men right now who are in the sanctuary, if anything should ever happen, you need to react immediately if there is ever a violation or a shooter or somebody committing an act of violence, you run towards them, and as I'm running towards them, you move out of my way <laughs> and grab their gun hand because you'll save lives. Too often when something happens, everybody stands around shocked with their mouth opening, not knowing what to do. I'm telling you what to do. Get up off your seat and run. You hear me, men? And ladies, you go the other way. <laughs> okay? Our society is so different today. The difference between the Titanic and the Concordia, you remember? In the Titanic and the disaster, who got off the ship first? Women. Women and children. Women and children first, and the men died because there weren't enough lifeboats. What happened with the Concordia in the Mediterranean? The men pushed aside and crawled over the top of the women and children to escape. They're not men, they're cowards. Terrible, disgrace. And that's what we produce today, but not here, right? Not you. Hmm? No, we, won't, we will not faint in the day of adversity. This is the day of adversity. Don't cower. We have the truth. And we have the Holy Spirit. And children are precious. Precious. 
Do not faint in the day of adversity or your strength is small. Deliver those who are drawn towards death to hold back those stumbling to the slaughter. Who are the most innocent? Who are the most vulnerable? Who are the ones leading to leading and being marched to death more than any other now? It's the unborn. What happened in Nazi Germany when all of the Jews would go by the back of the church because the train tracks were behind so many of the churches and as the Jews were screaming out asking for help, what did the pastors do? Enter into a song, sing a little louder, sing a little louder. So they drowned out the sounds of the screaming Jews. Like, like the Jews in the past who would go around in their euphoric highs and scream and drowned out the screams of their dying children. No, listen, we, we have to do everything we can to bring sense, to bring sanity, to bring righteousness, to bring Christ into the heart of these people. The real issue is not abortion, is it? The real issue is the heart. We need to double down on everyone and say, oh, God, use me to bring salvation to those who are lost and dying. When I came to the realization I wanted to kill my own son, to this day I can sit down and think about that and cry. But I thank God he kept me from it. But there are many who have had abortions, but God has forgiven. And let me ask you the question. Every, chi every child who dies before the age of accountability, where do they go? To with Jesus. Every single one. Take comfort in that. For if you say, surely we did not know this. Can anybody say that? that can anyone say that abortion isn't going on? Can anyone say that abortion isn't murder? No, they can't. They really can't. They say it's a woman's choice. It's a woman's choice to kill her child. That's right. She makes the choice to kill her baby. Fetus is simply the Latin word for baby, infant. If you say, surely we did not know this, does not he who weighs the hearts consider it, he who determines what truth is, he who keeps your soul, does he not know it? And will he not render to each man according to his words? deeds. See, God doesn't listen with his ears. God listens with his, and he measures according to your deeds. Now you're armed and dangerous. You're equipped. Amen? Shall we stand, Pastor David?